Amaroff from NASA's Astronomy Picture of the Day. Welcome to everyone on the YouTube live stream. We're very happy that you're with us. These webinars are monthly events for members of the Night Sky Network. And we'll put a couple of links to information about the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and the Night Sky Network in the chat in just a moment here. So before we introduce Robert, here's Vivian with just a couple of announcements. Good evening, everyone. I uh, want to let you know that we just sent out, you should have received, if you are an active club coordinator, so the coordinator for an active club, you should have just received an email from the Night Sky Network. Um, uh, inviting you to request a speaker from NASA. We have a new program that we have connected with Universe of Learning. And for clubs who are active, that's clubs that report on at least two events in the last quarter or five in the last year, then um, you should be an active club and you can request speakers from NASA. So this is one that's open for the next uh, two weeks, I believe. Uh, you should have received an email if not, you can give us, uh, you can send us an email, make sure that you are an active club, that your club is active. Um, and I'll stick some links in the chat about how to get active if you're not sure about that. Um, what else? Oh, I want to invite you all to uh, become members of uh, to apply to become as uh, an eclipse ambassador. We are running a new program this year for uh, amateur astronomers who want to partner with undergraduate students and um, to become eclipse ambassadors to get your communities off the path ready for the eclipses. This is before the eclipses happen. Um, it's a really fun program. You'll get a lot of swag and glasses and you'll get trained on um, the best eclipse science and outreach, uh, public engagement. And we'd love to have you all be a part of it. Thank you so much, Dave, for putting all those in the chat. And um, I think that's about it for tonight. Thanks, Brian and Robert. I'm looking forward to this evening. All right. Thanks, Vivian. For those of you on Zoom, you can find the chat window and the Q&A window at the bottom edge of the Zoom window on your desktop. Please feel free to greet each other in the chat window, making sure that you go down to the bottom and select everyone. Um, if you don't do that, it only goes to the four of us that you can see here, uh, the panelists. Um, also, you can let us know if you're having any technical difficulties in the chat, or you can send us an email at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org. Please put any questions that you have for Robert into the Q&A window. That really helps us keep track of them. And a lot of times people have the same question, and, and that way we know if there's uh, you know some questions in common, and so those will... Uh, kind of float to the top or questions that are related. And so it helps us to kind of put those together. And so remember questions into the Q&A. So let's see, I need to hit this other record button. Hey, welcome to the January webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Dr. Dr. Robert Nemeroff to our webinar. As I did the last time Robert was with us, I'm going to direct you to read his bio in the webinar description on the NSN website. And we'll say that he and Jerry Bennell, who gave this talk in December 2021, created APOD in 1995. For many of us, visiting the APOD site is a daily occurrence. Maybe we follow it on Instagram, but wherever we view it, it is a pilgrimage of sorts to a place filled with beauty and awe at this universe we live in. It's one of those places where we can let the cares of this particular world fade from our awareness as we contemplate our place in the greater cosmos. Not only does APOD inspire us, it also teaches us, perhaps most importantly, how we can become better humans. Thank you, Robert, for all you do and coming here this evening to share with us the work you do that brings joy to all of us. So please welcome Dr. Robert Nemeroff. Hi, thanks. What a, what a great introduction. So I hope hope this is, lives up to, to that introduction, but thank you very much. Okay, so now I will try to share my, I created some slides, so I am somewhat prepared here. So I'm going to try to um, slideshow, start, and now I'm going to share screen of that one. There, so I'm hopeful that you are seeing my- it Looks great introductory slide okay perfect so I'm, you might have gotten a, a brief shock from that but it's okay 
Okay, so postcards from the universe 2022 via starting picture today APOD. So these you are the two senior editors, and um, let's get started. Oh, what is this APOD? So some people know what it is, but some don't. So here you go, apod.nasa.gov. Um, that takes you to our main site. Um, so we started this in 1995, and we forgot to stop essentially. Um, so uh, we're one of NASA's most popular science websites. We do over a million page views a day. Uh, so when we check our log files, which we don't every day, but every day we do pretty much, we find out that pretty much every university, every major university accesses APOD. We can see some accesses there. We have volunteer translators. So uh, your language probably is, is translated into uh, if it's not English. And we also, I've learned recently that our British mirror um, operator says that he does translate some of the Americanisms into British. So I did not know that. Okay. So we're also available all over social media because people volunteer to do it and we say, okay. And so let's start out uh, about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, when there was another comet in the sky that some people might have forgotten, and it was Comet Leonard. And so Comet Leonard had a really long tail. So this tells you the title of the APOD up here. I hopefully you can see my, my cursor go back and forth as a big arrow. So if yeah, that's not it. true, somebody tell me. We can uh, see it. Okay. And then somewhere on the slide, it should say well, how you get this APOD. If let's say you missed it and you think, oh no, this will never be back again. I've missed it forever. You have not missed it forever. You've missed it once. So you can go to the the APOD address, or we could just search for the title and you can bring up this slide and stare at it for hours until your relatives become concerned. Um, but here we have a, a really cool comet, Comet Leonard, which was all the rage a year ago, a little more than a year ago, and it had a really long tail, but you couldn't easily see this tail. So if you went out and you know where to look, you wouldn't see this. If you had a big telescope and you went out to look at this, you wouldn't see this. Why not? It's such a big telescope because a big telescope sees only a tiny little bit of the sky. So you're best off with uh, a long duration camera exposure. And when you do that, then you can see this really long tail that goes constellations across the sky of Comet Leonard. And so uh, we got some really great images. And so we, uh, we featured one a year ago, January. Okay, its tail was unusual. We have another comet around, which I will discuss later, which is like a, another just barely visible um, comet. Um, but uh, we'll talk about last year's comet, uh, Comet Leonard's tail wag. So this is a video, so I have a few videos. So don't be too concerned, it's fine. So what you're seeing here looks like some kind of gray snow, but what it is is actually one image subtracted from the previous image in a video. And this is best for seeing good, not maybe best, good for seeing comet tails change. So buried in this gray snow is a comet and you will see it when I click the, the video mode because then you will start seeing the tail move. So hold on, ready, go. See it? You can see the long tail wag. That was so good. Here we go again. Boom. So this is over more than a week. Okay. So is Comet Leonard. So last year, uh, images of the center of our galaxy from a radio. Uh, observatory set of telescopes, Meerkat, uh, started reporting and we saw the center of our galaxy last year in greater detail than we have ever seen it before. So here is a false color image of the center of our galaxy. Sagittarius A star is here in the center. So the center of that is a black hole that's more than a million solar masses, which is in the center of our galaxy. And there's all this strange stuff around it. Now, if you looked in optical light toward the center of our galaxy, you would see nothing like this. You would see a relatively boring part of the constellation of Sagittarius. But if you go into the infrared and the radio, then you start to see the cool stuff, including things like this, this these filaments, these gas filaments that are in this unusual arc and all these other strange arcs. And here's a legend as to what you're seeing. And this is really cool. So even now, uh, Meerkat and, um, and other 
um, telescopes are investigating the center of our galaxy, which we're learning more and more. And we're hopefully one day going to see a, a really good image of this central black hole in the center and what it's doing there. All right, so this past year in March, jumping ahead, this is our sun. And our sun is becoming more and more active. A few years ago, our sun was so boring, it was incredibly boring. And it wasn't predicted how boring it would be. When you would look at the sun, you would have like no blemishes on it. There would be no active regions, no sunspots, no prominences on the edge, no solar coronal mass ejections off on the side. But a year ago, a month or so, a couple months, uh, it threw off at one of the largest prominences seen. And uh, through a coronal mass ejection, and here it is. And it's actually roughly the size of the sun, but nowhere near the mass of the sun. So our sun, as we just showed on APOD a few days ago, is just incredibly active. Um, it's outproducing its activity that was expected, and we were expecting a pretty active solar maximum, and it's more active than that. So first of all, that's great. It's great because our sun should have a good time. Why should the Earth only have a good time? Our sun should have a good time too. But uh, also, um, it's uh, it's a little bit dangerous because it throws off more stuff. Oh, it's good time for Earth a little bit too because we can see more aurora typically. If the sun is throwing off more particles in the solar system, more of them are coming, hitting the Earth's magnetosphere, being funneled into the down the Earth's magnetic field lines onto the Earth and hitting the Earth's atmosphere and glowing, causing aurora, and that's great. The concern is that we might get a big um, ejection headed in that could strongly compress the Earth's magnetic field and cause um, electronics to do strange things. So they would carry, when you change the magnetic field through any electronic loop, you generate uh, a current in that loop and the Earth's power structures, power grids might not be up to the speed. And so we're worried that a strong um, solar event could cause power problems here on Earth. But so far, we're good and we have some pretty aurora. So and here's, here's possibly a really cool thing to see, possibly uh, omen of things that might be in our future. Okay, Mars. So we've got stuff rolling around Mars. This is a golden age of solar system exploration where we have rovers on Mars. And uh, so uh, there's two, US has two big rovers. And uh, let's see, I forget which rover did this one. I think it's um, Curiosity. So it rolls around and it sees cool stuff. So this is actually its size of a penny here. Penny would be about as big as this. So this is a really small thing but it's not your average rock. It's a really strange looking rock. If you didn't know, you might think it was some kind of flower, but it's not a flower because if it was, it would have eclipsed all the news and you would have heard about nothing else for the next month. What we think it is, is we think that uh, there were gaps between rocks when, and when Mars had a lot more water, water would flow and concretions would fill in some of the gaps between rocks. And these concretions would be compressed and they would become more dense than the rocks of which the cracks they were in. And then the rocks would erode away and then you're left with what was left behind. They're an odd shaped concretion. So that's our best guess for what this is. But it sure is intriguing. And so all both rovers, uh, um, Curiosity and Perseverance are rolling around looking for cool things, among them cool rocks and trying to understand what's going on. That was this past year. Okay, maybe one of the most famous pictures of space of modern times is the uh, pillars of star formation in the Eagle Nebula. So this past year through Hubble, um, here it says on the lower left, this is a Hubble and it was processed by some amateurs and they took some of the images and they used modern processing techniques and um, zoomed in on the end of one of these pillars and saw some really cool, well, we saw them before, but really, clearly imaged some what's called eggs, where they're not, they're, they're eggs sort of of star formation. So stars are forming in these things. And when these stars, some of them are massive enough, so they have winds and the, that the winds push away the rest of the pillar and erode the pillar. So these pillars are only around for, you know, like a million years or so. But looking at the end of this one pillar, we really got some really cool images of 
these eggs where stars form. And you can see in here, some of the stars that are really red, the red areas, are stars, are, young stars are in there and they appear so red because their light is going through a lot of dust. So a lot like our own sun looks sun red at sunset, these stars in there, they look really red because they're going through dust. And this was processed by amateurs from Hubble data this past year. Okay, this is a really cool image. That image, this was a figure that was sent to us and described the sky in the year before. So yes, it's 2023. Yes, I'm talking about 2022. But in 2022, they talked about 2021. So this one image sums up the night sky or the all sky, night and day, in all of 2021. I just think it's really cool. Um, so every 15 minutes, this, um, this sky camera uh, that saw a lot of the sky in the Netherlands uh, took a picture. And then during the day, it would show mostly blue sky, but sometimes white clouds. At night, it would show mostly dark night, but sometimes the moon would go by and light up the night sky, and you can see streaks of moonlight. And then at sunrise and sunset, you can see it's getting somewhat blue. It's called the blue hour, as most of you, many of you would know. So that's a good time to take pictures of landscapes. So a lot of the images we have that, of APOD that are landscape images that have the night sky in the background, the foreground was taken during the blue hour because you can just about make stuff out and a long duration exposure will, will pick up details of the foreground and then soon it will be night. And so you can see the thinnest part of this is where there's uh, the um, summer solstice maximum day because you have the most day part and the and we uh, just passed the northern part. The, the, this is the northern sky where you see mostly night at the... Uh, at the um, Northern at the winter solstice in the northern sky, and when it's in the middle, that's when the equinoxes are. So we're we've already had our longest night, and we're headed toward equinox in the 2023 version of this. So, all right. So yeah, there have been some cool auroras. We get sent a lot of aurora pictures, and some of them are just really cool. The ones that are the most popular are the ones that create imagery in the mind of the people looking at them. And then people say, oh, cool, I think that looks like this. This looks like that. So this one looks to me and many people like a whale. So here you see the green aurora. You can see the, the corona here, and you can see what looks like curtains. And so this is uh, charged particles, mostly electrons flowing into the Earth's atmosphere. And this is a forest in Sweden, but it's an opening in the forest. And so it looks, you know, it's a very wide angle image that you maybe not Appreciate you can see a, a city here, and um, you can see a, a clear aurora, of which there's uh, many this this time of in the solar cycle as we head towards solar maximum, and it just looks really cool. So to me, it looks like a um, as I said, a well. And we asked people to volunteer what they thought it looked like, and I forgot what they said, but there was a whole bunch of a uh, whole bunch of things. So that was uh, this past year. Oh, we had the big planet parade uh, in April and uh, May of last year. So this was a planet parade from the south sky. So this is the Sydney Opera House in Australia. So these are not stars. These are lights on the Sydney Opera House, which is a beautiful structure. But going up from there, you can see a planet line, sometimes called a planet parade. So you can see Jupiter, Venus, Mars, and Saturn all lined up. And so these guys have been switching places over the past several past year. And uh, so now in the morning, actually, I think you see Venus and Saturn very close together. And I think they were really close together just a couple of days ago. Um, so uh, then, well, I'll show you in a bit, maybe it's the next slide. Yes, here it is. So this is from the Northern hemisphere when it was more spread out. This is the line of the ecliptic. So I think this was taken from Italy. And so this is Mercury, Venus. The moon was in the lineup, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. And then you can see Uranus, Uranus you can't really see. It was digitally enhanced. So you could see it on the image. Digitally enhanced is Uranus and Neptune. But you can see that is really where they are. And it makes a big line. This is the line of the ecliptic. So to a rough approximation, all of the planets, including the Earth, orbit the sun in about a plane. 
It's in the same plane. And when they all line up in a row, you can see this plane as a line. So uh, there was a big planet parade this past year that was uh, pretty cool. But it was in the morning, which is harder for many people to do. So let's see. OK, so we still have spacecraft all over the solar system. So this is uh, NASA's big spacecraft at Jupiter. It's called Juno, as you might know. So every month or so, Juno, in its elliptical orbit, swoops past um, Jupiter. Did I say Saturn? Jupiter. And uh, gets a close-up view. And there are videos that we put on there on APOD and are seen around the web. And you can see uh, videos of these swoop pasts. And here's just a really cool image that shows the dark, the, the bands and zones that go around Jupiter and the, the cloud system. So the Earth is smaller than this, this storm cloud there. Uh, what's somewhat unusual here is this, this spot here, this dark spot, which is not a black hole into the center of Jupiter, sadly. But it is the shadow of a, um, of a moon. And uh, if I remembered which moon that was, I could tell you. Actually, I could probably find out. Let me just go over here, April 27th. Do, do, do. Um, no, okay. Uh, it's certainly a moon. I think it's Ganymede. Um, and just the detail on Jupiter of its clouds is amazing. So Juno is investigating Jupiter's clouds, its magnetic field, its gravitational field, and trying to determine if Jupiter has a solid core and it looks like if there's some solid hydrogen deep in there, but it's still investigating this and it's still looping around. Okay, this is a really cool image. Uh, so this is, uh, many people go out and they see usually just the moon or the sun, but if there's, there's a lot of ice, particularly flittering down, in the Earth's atmosphere, not in the Moon's atmosphere. The moon has very little atmosphere or the Sun's atmosphere. But uh, then what you do is this starts reflecting sunlight or moonlight in different ways. So uh, here you can see the Moon here. And then there's things called moon dogs. People might have seen sun dogs off to the side of the Sun about 22 degrees away. So they're part of the 22 degree halo that goes around the Sun or Moon whatever is reflecting. And then the ice crystals in the atmosphere, these, the long things are clouds, but the ice crystals in the atmosphere show you different, reflect in different ways, depending on the orientation and the density of the ice crystals. So this circumzenith arc goes around the zenith angle, which is the, the zenith is the, the highest point over you. Um, so um, there's many different circles. Now you are unlikely to see all of these yourself, which is why when you take them all, people send them into, into APOD and then sometimes we will, we will run them. Um, and uh, so this was a really cool one um, taken by Alan Dyer. Um, okay. So see if you can find the man in the moon. So the man in the moon is something that people always talk about, but not everybody really knows. So, uh, everybody can see the moon without a telescope or anything like that, but different cultures have different folklore for what it is they see in the moon. There's a woman in the moon, there's a rabbit in the moon, and the man in the moon is most more of a Western thing. And it sort of depends on what, where the moon is in your sky, because as the moon of the night progresses, you can see uh, more different things. But at one click here, we'll show you that there's a, this is what is typically known as classically the man in the moon, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. But this is only one of two men in the moon here because here's uh, a friend of the astrophotographer has his telescope there. And uh, here you can see, see him there too. So this moon has, has two men in it. So, uh, so we ran this because it was artistic. It, was, uh, it shows you, you know, the moon, which is one of the most common icons. Many times the moon is a very popular, um, makes popular apods. Uh, so we try to, and people, everyone's familiar with the moon. One of my pet peeves is every time I see a movie or a TV show, there's always a full moon. And so now uh, whenever I see a TV show or a, um, a movie where there is not a full moon, I will try to give a high five to someone near me. And then if they know me, they know why I've done that. 
because the moon is not always full. Uh, but here, you know, we show a lot of full moons. It's true on APOD as well. And uh, so here we go. Okay. Um, let's see, I can't see the question window. Okay. What is the most viewed or asked for APOD? Okay. Coincidentally, this is one of the most viewed APODs of, uh, not asked for, viewed APODs of this past year. Uh, this is the Andromeda Galaxy over the Sahara Desert. So this is, again, there's people in there too. A lot of people try to include themselves or their friends in there. Um, and so this is one of those. Uh, so this is a kind of image that's become quite popular um, recently. I'm sorry, my cat wants attention here. So I'm a little distracted off to the side. But, um, but what happens is during the blue hour or some other, you, you take an image of the foreground and then you wait and then you take a long, then you keep that one in your camera or download it. And then you take a long duration image of the background. And then you superimpose those and you get cool stuff. And so we're getting, you know, 10 years ago on APOD, we almost never saw anything like this, but now we get stuff like this submitted, you know, many days a week. We don't show them all, of course, we only show some of them, but this one was really cool. So here you can see M31, the Andromeda galaxy. It's big on the sky, although you can't really tell that much scale other than the scale of the people. Um, and there's a, a small satellite galaxy of M31 here, and you can see the star field. So it really well captured all of this. And it was pretty cool. So this was one of the most popular ones we had. Actually, coming up soon is the most popular one. Now we judge on popularity not, it, we can look at our log files at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, which is our most popular site. So that's the original place that updates with the NASA astronomy picture of the day on apod.nasa.gov. But it's because Facebook crunches the numbers and makes them so easily available, it's most easy for us to see the Facebook, APOD's Facebook mirror, to see what numbers those have. So this one we know was very popular on the, um, on the APOD Facebook page. So if you go to Facebook, you can just type in Astronomy Picture Today and you'll find us. You, know, you can please follow us. Um, you can also see what images might be coming up because we try to test for popularity on something called Facebook Sky. So they, it's Facebook, all the Facebook preamble and APOD.SKY. And uh, so we run about two or so images a day there. And uh, popularity is not the only reason why we post uh, APOD images. Educational content is a big thing. Topicality, something that's happening uh, recently is, an, is another big thing. Educational content, you know, things like that are all really important. But popularity is important to us. So one of our things is if it's popular, we want to know that. And then maybe we can reverse it and say, okay, here's a popular image. Here's some educational aspects of that popular image. So we go backwards. We say, we take the popular image and say, here's where the cool, here's what the astronomy stuff is about that image, as opposed to trying to find the most educational image and then trying to explain that. Because a lot of these images have a life of their own anyway. They're popular, they're set around the internet and or, or you know social media. And so we feel, if something is already popular on social media, it does not disqualify it from APOD. In fact, it makes it more likely it would run APOD because then if it's not completely fabricated, it's, it has some real science in it, we want to explain that science. All right, I got off, got off on a tangent. But the cat disappeared, so anyway. All right, so it was uh, not to loosen cloud season. So in uh, summer, late summer, so when was this, July, um, the upper atmosphere lights up, uh, polar mesospheric clouds, where um, the sunlight reflects off of high clouds, the, particularly the, um, the ice crystals in the high clouds. And uh, so here, some people, they, we get a lot of pictures of just the clouds, and those are good. But of course, what we're looking for is we're looking for context. So Paris, right? So what's the most iconic thing in the world possibly, and in Paris for sure. And that's the Eiffel Tower. So here we go. So here we got a good image, uh, as good as many submitted of the background clouds, but now you can see it in the context of a, 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 you know, a, a landmark that's world famous. So we like the world famous landmarks. So if you're looking to get your image on APOD and don't just take an image of what it is you're seeing, get some kind of interesting foreground. APOD has different planes. 
So this one doesn't have a background plane where you can see like the Big Dipper in the background, but that would be cool if you could, right? So there's the foreground plane, then there's, you know, the maybe the atmospheric plane, and then there's, um, maybe there's a stellar plane and maybe there's a galaxy plane there. So if you can get as many of them going and having content as possible, then we would maybe look more favorably on those. Uh, as long as it's not too blurry because people just can't tolerate the blurry. We will want a blurry image sometimes, but it has to have a tremendous amount of educational content. So for us to do that. So yeah, it was a, it was a notable Noctilucian cloud. So, what causes noctilucin clouds? There are satellites that study this isn't always well known. Um, it could have to do with the exhaust of a spacecraft, um, and it could have to do with um, with cosmic rays or things that create something in the atmosphere that cause nucleation points for ice to form. It's still being studied, even though noctilucin clouds are visible, uh, are really interesting. You know, after sunset and before sunrise. Uh, they're still being studied for what they are and what makes them more common. Okay, so this one's a bit of a game. It's kind of different. See if you can find the moon here. So uh, if you know where the moon is in this, if you didn't know before, so if, you, if you've already done this before, uh, then maybe you can chat or Q&A where you think the moon is. I'll give you a clue, it's not in the water, okay? This thing here, that's not the moon. That's some kind of buoy. Uh, so um, this is not a full moon. In fact, this is a almost new moon. So we get a lot of these pictures too. These are pretty cool. It's about a bit of a competition for when you can see a sliver of the moon uh, for a new moon. So then, Particularly when it's a sunrise or a sunset, then you see the moon through a lot of Earth's atmosphere, so that makes things more dim. So um, the moon is not here. So I'm now going to outline the moon with the cursor. So hold on, it's right here. This is the sliver of the new moon right here. Can you see it? I don't know, you can raise your hand or something. I can't see the raised hand. So the rest of the moon is here, but you can't see that at all because that blends in with the Earth's atmosphere. But this was kind of cool. It's really simple. I know I like simple stuff. You know, you can see it's like two colors. There is like blue water and there's orange sky, but there's something slightly different about this. And that is a sliver of a very new moon. And it's a game. So again, it points out the moon isn't always full and it's a game people play and you can play too. When can you see a sliver of the new moon near sunrise or sunset? It's always near sunrise and sunset. Okay, cool. Ah, Earth's recent climate spiral. Okay, so this I heard from the people over in the NASA Science Visualization Studio was really popular. And so I said, oh, let's have a look. And it was really popular. And so this is the year 1880, it's shown differently. So what's going to happen is you're going to see the Earth's temperature as the months go on and as the years go on. So January is at the top, I'll worry at you. Um, July is at the bottom and a year is one circle. And um, one degree Celsius, like me, it's about two degrees Fahrenheit or so. The more is uh, this gap here. So we're gonna watch the temperature of Earth go between 1880 and 2021. So ready, set, go. So here are the measurements, this um, temperatures were kept in certain locations, particularly this location, uh, probably not exactly sure. It might be near Washington, DC uh, every year. So the years go up and we can see, well, the temperatures are pretty much going around. And then suddenly when you get up into the 1940s and the 50s, they start going out a bit. And so as they're further out they go, the warmer it gets and the color is changing. So it's a little bit um, pinkish, going from blue to pink, well, red. So it's, it's the opposite, well, we'll get into that. So yeah, here red is hot and blue is cold. And so here we're into the 2000s. And uh, so now you see, ooh, went outside even the outermost circle. 
So now it's going to go on its end, and you can see that uh, the Earth recently has been warming up. Now, if you go back a long time, let's see, almost 22. Let me just check something here. Um, so if you go back 250 million years, you'll find out that uh, Earth is right now in a cold spell compared to what it was 250 million years ago. But compared to what it was 120 years ago, we're, we're warming up. And the data is showing that it's humans that are doing it. And so this, as you know, is one of the big, the big topics of modern time. How do, how do we cope with this? And uh, it's, a, it's a problem for the humans and people near coastlines in particular of planet Earth. This is something that we have to work on for the people that come after us to try to do the best we can for the people who come after us. Okay, we just did that. Okay, let's go back to Mars uh, where it's uh, drier. And uh, so this is a, uh, a popular, this is, um, I think this is Curiosity again. So I don't think I have a Perseverance image this year, I'm sorry. But uh, Percy's cool. And Percy has a, has a flying friend called Ingenuity. But uh, still, the Curiosity rover, it's about the size of a small car, rolls around, and looks for cool stuff, looks for signs of ancient life, looks for signs of ancient water. And it found this really cool perch. So it could, in theory, I don't think it's done this, roll up to the top of this and have a good view. Or if you were on Mars, you could climb to the top of this and look out across a fair amount of Mars. Now, what's weird about this is that the rocks on top are older than the, the stuff near the bottom. Here's my cat again. Um, so this is uh, an, an inversion point, which is Sikar Point in, I think, um, Scotland is it, I think is also an inverted point where the upper rocks are older than the lower rocks. So I was surprised by how popular this was and I was eventually told by somebody and it's because this looks like um, a battle cruiser from, from Star Wars. And I did not know that at the time. When I ran this, I had no idea and it did really well. And it's like, ooh, yeah, it does kind of look like a battle cruiser from Star Wars. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, as you know, um, interplay between the science fiction realm and the science realm. And many people who like science tend to like science fiction, like myself. I'm more of a Star Trek person, but I have seen uh, most of the Star Wars movies, particularly the early ones and the later ones, the ones in the middle, not so much. Uh, but I'm a big fan of Star Trek. And I like the vision of Star Trek that we go out and we explore and we don't, we don't keep killing each other. Anyway, um, stick our point on Mars as we learn more about Mars. And hopefully, uh, humanity will be going to live on Mars in your lifetimes. Okay, so 2022 was the dawn of the Webb Space Telescope images coming in. So this is called the Carina Cliffs from the Carina Nebula. And these are dust structures. And this image is in the infrared. And these are stars. And so the Webb Space Telescope co-orbits the sun with the Earth and is much bigger, several times bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope and sees not, so Hubble can see visible into the in ultraviolet, but um, Webb sees from about the orange, so it can see some visible, but into the infrared. And so a lot of, you can see through dust clouds in the infrared, uh, but this I think is the near infrared where you're not seeing so much of the dust clouds. So uh, the web is, uh, was launched on Christmas Day in 2021, which is a dramatic. I don't know who saw that, but that was amazing to watch. And uh, so uh, this is a, a collaboration between NASA, the uh, European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. And this was processed by people at the Space Telescope Scientific Institute. And it's just amazing, uh, the detail that's in this image. So. Uh, here we have another one. Um, so when I heard of Webb, I didn't think it would be doing much in the solar system. But here's a picture of Jupiter like has never been seen before, again, by the James Webb Space Telescope. And this was released last year. So here you can see many things. Jupiter doesn't look like it normally does because we're into the infrared here. So you can see some high clouds like the Great Red Spot. But here the Great Red Spot is not so red. Well, it is red in the infrared, but it's not portrayed as red in this false color image. And here you can see it's portrayed as white. 
And the white clouds are typically higher, and the low clouds are typically darker. And so we're learning a little bit about the 3D depth of Jupiter just from the JWST. We can also see northern and southern aurora. Um, we can see um, rings, the rings of Jupiter, uh, not as amazing as the rings of Saturn, but they're there. And we knew about them before Webb, but this is a really good image of them. And we can see some, um, some moons, smaller moons. Uh, at, at Astria, actually, I see them more than I say them. So many times I mispronounce them. Almothea, I think it is, and Adastria, which I might be mispronouncing. Io, I've heard enough to be able to pronounce correctly. So uh, JWST, James Webb has, uh, you know, has support things that hold the mirrors. And so you can see diffraction of light around those. And so you can see things that don't really exist there. So this diffraction spike here and this diffraction line here uh, don't really exist. But they're part of the images and sometimes they're cleaned up and sometimes they're not. But it's like when you see stars have crosses on them sometimes, stars are not crosses, okay? You're seeing the telescope holder. Many people, I guess, know from the Night Sky Network. But if you don't know that, you're seeing the telescope holder light ref uh, refract, you know, diffract around that. But yeah, this is a really cool image of Jupiter like we've never seen it before, showing us things that we've never known before. And Webb is just getting started. So here's another one. So here's the Tarantula Nebula of the LMC, Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a satellite um, to our Milky Way galaxy. And it has a, a star cluster called R136, which is a young star cluster. And there's lots of you know bright blue stars. Now this was taken in near infrared. So the blue was kind of made blue for our, for our thing. So we can see here, we can see a bright star and you can see the uh, diffraction spikes around it. So that's really bright. Actually, every star here has diffraction spikes, but the center part of the star is much brighter than the diffraction spikes. So you usually don't notice them. But for the really bright ones, you can see them. So this is infrared, but then you can go into the far infrared or actually it's the, the further into the infrared, closer to the radio wave. So when I click my clicker, you can see the next one, and this doesn't look like the same image, but it's the same field from the same telescope. It's just at a longer wavelength light. It's more red, infrared, than the infrared I just showed. So I can go back by hitting a little P button, and here we see the near infrared, far infrared, near infrared, far infrared. Now, how do I know? Uh, I might just be making this up. This is a completely different image. Well, for one thing, this is more blurry, which happens because the longer wavelength of mid-infrared light than near-infrared light. But let's look at this star right here where my cursor is. You see it right there? When I go backwards, there it is again. Forwards, backwards. So you know it's the same star. Let's try this one over here on the edge. See it? Forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. And this whole star cluster, most of it disappears. But because most stars there don't are not bright in the far infrared, in the mid infrared. So uh, it shows you that when we look at the sky in different ways, when we look at it at different wavelengths, when we look at it at different colors, we look at it in gravitational waves, we see a different sky than the sky we're used to looking at in optical light. And we learn more about the universe by looking at it in different ways. So James Webb does this for us and is still going. Well, of course, it's gonna go for many more years. Okay, this was the most popular book, the image according to Facebook uh, of 2022. I would not have guessed this. I was frequently surprised by what's popular and not, not popular. So, um, yeah, I've done doing this for a while, so not completely surprised, but this is a Pileus cloud. So this is a, cloud that's becoming a storm cloud. This is over China, but it didn't matter really where it was. So these are diffraction colors. So there is ice that is relatively the same amount of droplets of, that is diffracting sunlight, the same amount. So it looks very colorful. So you don't get this unless you have diffraction effects and unless you have things that are roughly the same uh, size that are that is diffracting light, and it makes it look, um, you know, really spectacular. So when you see this with your own eyes, it's like wow! It's like a strange rainbow in the sky, and so 
we were, we were sent this image and other images similar with uh, Peleus clouds. And uh, this one's just uh, the, the kind of, it's called iridescence when you see that kind of effect. Um, okay. So let's go to uh, out to the next planet, uh, Neptune. Well, a couple of planets out from JWST is James Webb Space Telescope. This is again uh, the web. So this is um, Neptune, and here you can see Neptune's rings. And this is Neptune's uh, biggest moon, Triton. So, you know, I didn't really include this image when I created this slide set. But then when I saw the advertisement for my, um, this, this webinar for Night Sky Network, it had me in front of this image. So I went back and put it in. But it is a really cool image. So this is a web image, again, from NASA, ESA, Canadian Space Agency. This is from the Near Infrared Cam. And you can see actually some background galaxies and you can see Neptune with its spots. And um, Triton is so bright that you really can't tell. This stuff you see around it, it's not real. This is not real texture of Triton. This is just telescopic stuff that's been put on there. So much dimmer is, um, and more spread out. Well, brighter by itself, but spread out is uh, Neptune and its rings. And so the detail on Neptune's rings was really high and was illuminating for uh, professional research astronomers of Neptune. Okay, so this was the year that we uh, practiced for the first time trying to defend our home planet. As you might know, unfortunately, every 100 million years or so, Earth gets smacked by something that knocks out a lot of life and you have an uh, annihilation event uh, that uh, kills a lot of the species. So we decided this humanity would probably not be happy with that. So what you do is if you know something is gonna hit the earth and you know it early enough, all you have to do is bap it a bit and you can, you can change its orbit. So one of the, the problems of this game is you have to know its orbit really well, or you could you know, like knock it, you could knock into something that was, wasn't gonna hit the earth, or you can knock it into something that's hit the Earth, but that's much more unlikely. But the idea is if we have a long enough baseline of watching an asteroid for long enough, you can get its orbit well enough to know if it's going to hit the Earth in the next decade or so. And then if you hit it early enough uh, before that decade is out, you know, before a few years, then you can knock it off its slight orbit and then it will miss the Earth. And it will be something to cool fly by the Earth. Now, the Earth gets hit by small things all the time. So we're really interested in knocking out the big stuff. So this is asteroid Dimorphos, which we did not know what it looked like very much, but you're gonna see it in this video. This is its friend Didymus, which we are now seeing in, in greater detail. So the idea is to impact this spacecraft. So you're gonna be part of this, you're gonna see the spacecraft hit this thing right here. And then, well, we'll continue the story of that. So this is a time lapse, so this took you know, hours to do, minutes to do. So here we're coming in and uh, zooming in. Now we've never seen what this asteroid looked like before. And it's like, oh, look at that. Cool, oh, all those boulders, oops. Now we're gonna go frame by frame. Hey, there's a lot of boulders. It's what's called a rubble pile, then boom. And then Dart died on, because it was supposed to. But, uh, we can run that again because it was kind of cool. But um, we kept tracking, not only NASA, but people who could see it kept tracking the, um, the orbit of this asteroid pair. And we found that the uh, asteroid pair actually did slightly change its orbit, which shows that we can do this. That if we get enough information in the future that something is going to be a danger to Earth, uh, we might be able to protect the Earth. Planetary defense, it's called. Okay, so now here's something that was a little bit unexpected. We kind of thought, many people kind of thought that, uh, let's go back again, that um, Dimorphos was more of a solid. But it turns out it was a rubble pile. And one of the ways we know is because when you hit it, they put a whole bunch of rubble, a big rubble plume, mostly dust. Uh, so, uh, no, okay. sorry, I didn't do that right. So here we go. So there's a plume going out there. 
So here you mostly see uh, Didymos, but then you see the plume coming up of Dimorphos. So, um, yeah, also later, these things develop tails that you could see if you had a, you know, if you could see deep enough, you could see just like comets, these asteroids develop tails because of the impact of NASA's DART spacecraft on it. Okay, cool. So let's now go back to uh, stars now. So this is a uh, wolf rayet star 140 as seen by James Webb Space Telescope, sometimes abbreviated by Webb. And this came out this past year. So the theme is the year in astronomy images. So this doesn't look like your average star. Well, first of all, you can see the, um, you can see the diffraction spikes, uh, but what are these things? So it turns out that this wolf rayet star is part of a binary system. Many stars, in fact, most stars are part of systems where, more, where there's more than one star. Our sun is a bit unusual, not crazy unusual, but a little bit unusual in that it's all by itself. But what happens is these two stars are in elliptical orbits. And so when they come in close to each other, they emit a burst of X-rays for one thing. They do things we don't yet know, but they also throw off a dust shell. And so here you see these dust shells, and this has been going on for quite a long time because you see a whole bunch of dust shells. So Webb was able to get a, a really good image of this system and more dust shells than have ever been seen before, which are particularly evident in the infrared. And so this is just like a, a surreal object. And you can see in the background, there's galaxies back there and there's stars. So you can see the normal Webb stuff, but you can see this unusual dust shell structure from Webb. Um, okay. This was an unexpected thing that happened in 2022. One of the brightest gamma ray bursts ever seen occurred last year. And it was really bright. It was uh, brighter than many satellites have ever seen before. Now, in the past, there was speculation that there have been mass extinction events, not only caused by asteroids hitting the Earth, but possibly because of gamma ray bursts were were aimed toward the Earth and were relatively nearby. And so the tremendous amount of gamma and X-rays that hit the Earth and UV light that hit the Earth was devastating. Not to all life, but to a lot of life. But this wasn't that bright. This was still like the brightest one we've seen. So it looks like a cartoon. So what's going on? So what happened is, along with the gamma rays, because it's called a gamma ray burst, so these things are usually seen in gamma rays because the gamma ray sky is very quiet. So when you see a flash of gamma rays, you're seeing it against the dark background. But if you were to look for this thing in the optical light or, or infrared light, the in optical infrared sky is so busy that there's like so many things around, you wouldn't know, oh, there's a little flyer there, wouldn't know. But in the gamma ray sky, it's far and away brighter than anything. But it also emits a lot of X-rays. So these X-rays pass through dust clouds uh, in our Milky Way gas clouds and they bounce off them and they create rings around the center. So these are X-ray rings around the center of where the scammer burst was. And we knew it was bright enough so that we knew to look in this direction. So this was seen with the Swift Observatory, another NASA observatory, and uh, processed by several people. But I like this one because it looked cool. And uh, peep, there are colorized versions of this. And uh, yeah, it looks like a cartoon, but this is real data. Uh, so these, generally, the longer the time is from the burst, the, what, the longer the X-ray reflection shell is. And so we're still studying, even though the gamma ray burst is pretty much over, it's over, um, some star exploded and died and in a great burst of gamma rays. Um, but uh, we're still, we got a lot of data and we're still using this to better understand gamma rays and the X-rays they emit. And this happened just this past year. Okay, so uh, a lot of amateurs do a lot of really cool stuff. They, they, they amateurs are, um, are processing images, not only images they take themselves, but images that come out from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and um, professional telescopes all over the world, including James Webb Space Telescope now. But this was images of Jupiter taken from the ground by an amateur over several days, but then using modern software, because as you know, we're undergoing a software revolution even again, and created what it looked like to see images of um, Jupiter's moons, Europa, Io, and, and Ganymede, I think, and Europa, 
uh, orbit Jupiter based on real images. So it's a, both real images and a reconstruction at the same time. So here we go. So this is, I think, Europa, and you're going to see these are the bands on, on Jupiter. And you can see three Galilean moons, but now you can see the, the shadow of Europa as it goes across. And you can see the great red spot, and you can see dark bands. Why Jupiter is changing is because the Earth is, um, Jupiter, as the Earth rotates, Jupiter's orientation in the sky changes. And so I thought this was really cool to take what's being able to be seen with telescopes that, that amateurs have on the sky and uh, combine them with modern you know, processing technology and create something that's real. So it's a combination of real and artificial intelligence creating something that could be seen but wasn't. Some of it was seen, but some of it wasn't. But that's a 24-hour image of Jupiter rotating that could not have been taken because the sun comes up, but it's been recreated. So hey, Rob, I, I just want to let you know it's almost the top of the hour. We can go till the very end, but we won't have time for questions. Okay, I'm going to go more quickly. Okay, this is, um, um, sorry, I sometimes take longer than I think. I always think I'm going to take shorts. This is um, um, for Halloween. This is the, the Bat Nebula. Um, there's stars forming in there. They cause the orange. Uh, this is the uh, an lunar eclipse that's seen from the South Pole. So there's aurora, and here you can see the moon does not rise and set at this time. It just goes across the sky, the South Pole. This is Artemis One, which is NASA's its own spacecraft that went around the moon. And you can see looking back toward the Earth and Moon, you can see both the Earth and the Moon. I had the backwards Moon and the Earth, and you can see NASA with its new. Um, it's old um, worm logo again. So Artemis II will take place, uh, I think, next year and will actually land people on the moon. Okay, so this is one of the great foreground background images. This foreground was taken mostly during the blue hour and there's so much going on here. Andromeda galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, the Big Dipper where the stars were enhanced, Aurora, Lofton Islands in Norway, which is Northern Norway. And the newest, the newest thing that you can see over the next week or two, if you have, Dark skies, you can see Comet Zwicky Transient Facility ZTF uh, is just nearing the Earth in the next few days. And here you can see the, the green coma and two ion tails and a dust tail over here. And if you go out, it's just at the edge of naked eye visibility, but if you have binoculars, you can see it. So please take a star chart out and look for it in the next few days, because after a couple of weeks, it'll just fade rapidly and you won't have a chance. And this is an image of a, an exoplanet that was confirmed by James Webb Space Telescope. It's my last image. And uh, so this image was not, this is not an image, this is an illustration, but this illustration was created by artificial intelligence, something called Deep, deep AI. And it's really cool because um, there are space artists that do this, but now you can type in some search terms into an artificial intelligence agent, engine, and it can tell you what it might look like from the surface of a planet orbiting a red dwarf star. Or if, very close in. So here we have lava flows and stuff like that. So this, I hope, opens up a new era of uh, visualizing the exoplanets that are being discovered. So thank you. Please, if you don't know, please check out the Night Sky Network at nightsky.jpl.nasa.gov. APOD celebrated its 27th, 27th anniversary in June. Um, I have a book. Ask me about it. Send me an email if you want to know that's coming out soon. And then APOD was fortunate. This is self-promotion slide. Sorry. So I'm patting myself on the back, there we go. Uh, APOD on the back. So APOD received the outreach prize of the International Astronomical Union in 2022 in South Korea. And for people following American television on November 4, you found out that the clue for $1,600 on one of the uh, Ape Jeopardy clues was the NASA Astronomy Picture of the Day revealed that this largest moon of Mars may eventually disintegrate. Scary indeed, please answer in the form of a question. So with that, I will stop sharing and, uh, oh, here I am again, and be happy to, uh, to answer questions. So thank you for, for attending. Bravo, we're all clapping, even though you can't hear all of us. Thank you so much, Robert. <laughs> okay, thank you, it's all, always great to do this. I'm always happy to review it. It's a, it's a great project and it gives me a chance to go through these. And uh, some of which I've forgotten sometimes, like, oh yeah, that was this year, I forgot about that. But now I can relive it again, so. Well, I should also say that, that um, 
you know, the ASP, we give uh, a number of awards every year. And you and Jerry won, uh, what was it, 2013 or 14 or something like that? Yes. One of, was, which one was that? Was that the Klumpke Roberts or, or something like that? Yes, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, the, the Klumpke Roberts Award. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, we were very grateful to receive that. So uh, Jerry and I went out to, uh, to San Francisco and, uh, and got that one. And that was, uh, I think that was maybe our first big award. So, uh, so we said, wow, people are noticing. So that, thank you. ASP for that. Yeah, we felt very fortunate that uh, both of you came out and were able to basically give this talk in person. <laughs> so it was it was really great in the the planetarium, um, or not the planetarium, but in the theater at Chabot Space and Science Center in Oakland. Yes, I hadn't been there. That's a really cool place. Yeah. So. All right. Okay, let me look at the questions here. Yeah, we didn't have very many because you were so succinct and with, uh, you know, very detailed. There are a couple of, uh, um, you know, James has got a question, you know, I'll, I'll just go ahead and answer this one that, uh, can you look at this webinar again? Yes, indeed. This webinar will, was recorded. It will be on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel, and it will also be on the Night Sky Network uh, webpage in the outreach resource section. And so it should be there um, by tomorrow. And so definitely you can go back and look at this again another time. So. Okay, we had a good question from Dana, uh, who asks, uh, can you tell the age of by counting the shells around the wolf ray at star? And well, so the problem is you can count how many times they've been around recently. But the shells, as they go out, the shells are moving out, they become fainter and fainter. And so eventually we lose count of those. And I think there are only a small fraction of the age of the entire system. So it's a clever idea. And surely tree rings work for trees. But my guess is that unless we can track these shells out much further, that we don't get a good age for the system, but we get a good age for how long they've been interacting that strongly. So Dave, Dave has a question, and that reminds us that this oh, is a, a good one to ask. He, he says, how many images are submitted for consideration each day? What percentage are actually reviewed? And uh, is it annoying when people resubmit the same image? Uh, so we reject about 20 images for every one we're able to run, uh, which is why I'm happy that we post some of the good submissions on Facebook, so apod.sky account. So, uh, so that gives you know exposure to images that we can't run. So I'm, I feel bad that we get so many good images that we can't run them all. And even all, we can't even post many of them to Facebook side. We just get so many good. The accomplishments of astrophotographers have just gone through the roof. And we can we don't even run necessarily the best ones. We run some of the best ones, but we run the most topical ones sometimes, and the ones that have the most educational content sometimes. But we get a lot that we can't keep going. Uh, we can't We can't post. So yeah, we're always, um, let me see how many I've gotten during this talk. I've gotten one on Orion um, and one on a rocket launch. So I've gotten two during this talk. I haven't looked at them yet. Um, I know so I've got a couple of friends who uh, their goal in life, I think, is to have their photo show up or their image show up on APOD and hasn't happened yet, but they they continue to have high hopes. Well, so I'm flattered by that, but in my, what I believe is that people should try to do their own personal best. So um, when people run, let's say a marathon, like the Boston Marathon, I'll just pick one out. Um, I don't run marathons, but I, I do. Other, I don't try to win the Boston Marathon try to do better than you've done before and try to talk about it with your friends. So we get so many images. So you have a one in 20 chance of getting yours on APOD if you're an accomplished astrophotographer. So your goal in my view should be to keeping getting better and better at your craft. And the, the reason why we choose images might have nothing to do with how good your images, image was. It might have something to do with other things completely. So although I'm flattered by that, I think people should be more self-motivated. 
So sorry, that might be a little. So that's that's what I think about it, though. Well, you know that that that's good advice for most of life, I think, too. So yeah. thank mm -hmm. you, and, and I think that on that note, um, that's going to be it for tonight. And so thank you very much, Robert, for joining us this evening, and thank you everyone for tuning in. And as we noted, this uh, webinar, along with many others will be are on the night sky network website in the outreach resources section as well as on the night sky network youtube channel you can join us for our next webinar on thursday february 23rd when dr robert zellum from the jet propulsion laboratory returns to share with us how you can get involved in nasa's search for exoplanets so keep looking up and we will see you next month thanks robert you never disappoint, I gotta say it. Okay, so I don't know if I'm still on the recording stuff, but I, am I still live on? We're the, on, uh, we're still here. Okay, still here. Well, what is the audience still here? Are we just having the- Oh, they're still here. They can, you know, we have- okay. a... All right, so good. So if they have questions or something like that, I can hang out.